Hello and welcome to 28 Newsmakers. I'm Jane Ann Bugda. When you think of PennDOT, what do you think about? In the summertime, construction, and in the wintertime, salting and cindering were needed. But there's a lot more to the PennDOT story, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Joining me, my co-host, our lead investigator here on 28 News, Andy Mahalshik, and the PennDOT answer people, Carol Crane and Dave Crisanda. We are on the road with PennDOT when 28 Newsmakers returns. And welcome back to 28 Newsmakers. I'm Andy Mahalshi. Joining us this morning, our executive producer here at 28 News, Jane Ann Bugda, and also two very special guests from PennDOT, two people who you may know from uh, various media circles over the year. Both have experience both uh, in newspaper, Carol Crane with the Citizen's Voice for uh, quite a long time, a very good investigative reporter there, now working for PennDOT, and also Dave Crisanda, who also worked in local television for a long time, and we had the pleasure of working to, for, and against each other for a lot of years, right. and Dave and Carol uh, welcome both here today. Thanks, we Andy. want to talk about today, and, and of course, PennDOT has been in the news the last several months, unfortunately with uh, a horrible tragedy. People, uh, a man, 57-year-old Richard Bradley, run down and killed in Luzerne County near Freeland. And that brought about a wide range of questions, a, a plethora of, of issues that maybe for some uh, may not have been discussed quite often, safety per se, but also uh, what's PennDOT all about and what you at home can do to make PennDOT's job a little bit easier. But the Richard Bradley death, again, it's sad to say, was an eye-opener for many, many people around here, including some PennDOT workers who may have taken their own safety for granted. Recently, we spoke to Richard Bradley's family, and they're looking for answers in that horrible tragedy, the death of their father, their loved one. And we spoke to them recently about the situation when they went to the Luzerne County Courthouse to meet with DA Dave Lupus, and here's how that day went. There isn't a day that I don't wake up and I don't miss my father. Every day, every day, and I can't get answers. So they came looking for answers to the top prosecutor of Luzerne County, the DA, Dave Lupus. The family of Richard Bradley met for nearly two hours behind closed doors with Lupus. They wanted to know why 18-year-old Joseph Herring of Fern Glen was given a fine of $25. This after he drove his car into a PennDOT crew back on May 14th. It was just before 8 o'clock that day, Herring was driving on the Freeland Drums Highway on his way to high school. He slammed into the PennDOT workers. Five were injured. Bradley was killed. A month-long investigation resulted in a $25 fine against Herring. No serious charges. For the Bradley family, it just isn't right. Why can't I get answers? Those police reports, they're not finished. The investigation reports are not finished. But my father's case is closed with answers just left. It's, it's just awful. The Bradleys can't understand how the loss of a life can be equated with a $25 fine. We don't want to see what we had to go through, um, you know, someone else have to go through. I mean, it's, it's happening all the time. You see it almost every day where someone's almost getting run down and, and you know, it's happening and, and the, some of the statements that the drivers are making, it, it's just ridiculous that they would even make that statement and a lot of it has to do with what resulted out of this. Some pretty tough questions indeed and high emotion. But District Attorney Dave Lupus insists the way the law is written in Pennsylvania, there was no sign of gross negligence. There is no evidence to show that Herring did anything that led to that crash. 
such as speeding or drinking. Unfortunately, there are a lot of unanswered questions in this accident. It's a real tragedy. Uh, but as a prosecutor and the police as well uh, are charged with gathering evidence to, to warrant more serious charges. In this case, there really is none. Uh, charges are not warranted. And, and really, ethically and morally, uh, it would be an injustice to bring charges against someone just for purposes of, of public opinion or, uh, or, or, you know, due to public pressure. Andy Mahalshik, 28 News. Now, of course, the Richard Bradley case, uh, Dave and Carol, uh, Mark Bradley said something very insightful there. He said, you know, we're hearing things, we're starting to hear things said every day about situations like that, close calls. This case, I think, at least in my memory, has really brought to, to bear the issue of safety and driver common sense on the highway. Well, that's right, Andy. Uh, this, this is really, we hear this word talked about a lot, used a lot, tragedy. But this, this case was really a tragedy in many ways. It was a tragedy, of course, for us at PennDOT. It was a tragedy for Mr. Bradley's family, and it was a, also a tragedy for the family of that young driver. It, it was a really tough situation in that uh, it hurt a lot of people in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, with every tragedy, I always try to think that maybe, maybe something, something good could come out of it, something positive. And uh, what we're hoping to, that uh, at least could come out of something like this is to bring attention. No matter how many warning signs we put up, no matter how many uh, flashing lights we have, alarms, whatever, the bottom line is people have to slow down in a construction zone. And uh, I know that a lot of people told me and uh, my family, my relatives have told me that uh, since this accident, since they heard about it, they uh, pay special attention now in a work zone. You know, we always hear, well, uh, that, uh, I don't know, I go through the work zone, I don't see any workers. That's because they have different shifts, there's different things. You, ha you have to be prepared that uh, someone could be there at any time. And uh, if people would just take a second to slow down, and we like to say that, uh, you know, people say, oh, I can't, I have a schedule to meet, that kind of thing. If you really sat and, and timed it with a stopwatch, how long you're delayed in a construction zone? What is it, 30 seconds, maybe a minute at most, two minutes? Is that worth a life? That's, that's the bottom line question. To, to, uh, what's, what's more valuable, a life or losing 30 seconds of your day? And what, we have, what we're asking people to do is, uh, you know, whenever they're going through that construction zone, think of Mr. Bradley. Think that he's not just somebody out there, a nameless face. He has a family. All those guys out there, those men and women, that's what our signs are about that we have up now. Uh, my mommy, my daddy works here. We're trying to remind people that these are human beings with families who uh, they want to go home to. And we're asking people to just pay attention and slow down. Now, I know you're asking people to do that, but sometimes that's a lot to ask of the public because basically you're in the car, sometimes people aren't paying attention. Now has PennDOT done anything for safety's sake after these, this tragic turn of events on this roadway? Have they done anything else to ensure the safety of workers? I just want to add, ironically, two weeks after Mr. Bradley got killed, one of our workers again in the Hazelton area, Paul Middleton, had to literally dive out of the way of an oncoming car. He had a stop paddle, he was holding it up. It said stop. There were lights on, there were signs, and the car just didn't stop. He ultimately stopped a few feet down after he passed Mr. Middleton, but he, had he not had quick reflexes and, and dove, he would have been history. Mm -hmm. um, and our, what are we doing? We're looking into a lot of things right now. Again, there, there are some, um, things on the market now, uh, different lights maybe, um, maybe portable rumble strips. But even with all that, the bottom line is the responsibility is on the driver to be in complete control of their car all the time. And when they come to a work zone, that tells them that's a signal to not only slow down, but to be extra alert because in a work zone, there's equipment moving around, there's men moving around, so they have to be really on their guard, alert when going through that work zone. And I know people um, think sometimes it's an inconvenience um, having construction zones and things like that, but it's our job to make the roads swifter, smoother for the, the uh, Pennsylvania customers, our PennDOT customers. And the summertime is probably the only time of the year, warm weather, that we can do that. So we know it's a minor con inconvenience. But in the long run, we're giving our customers what they've asked us to give them. Have you checked with other states to see how they handle the problem? Or is it just as equal of a problem in other states with road workers and tragedies like this? Yeah. 
from what I've been able to gather, it's 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 a problem everywhere. It's pretty um, universal. Yeah, mm -hmm. highway safety. Um, the uh, position of the job of a highway construction worker is among the most dangerous in the United States. Mm -hmm. That's one thing you find out right away, and they have problems everywhere. That's why they're they're trying to develop new technologies. Um, new kind of warning systems, intrusion work zone, intrusion alarms, things like that are constantly being developed and you know as we hear them, hear about them, we look into them and you know to see if they'll help. But again the bottom line is it takes two to tango here. We can you know there's so much we can do but the drivers really have to help us with this. And Jane one thing I, I know that uh some of the states have actually contacted us about some of our initiatives, like uh, the uh, my mommy and my daddy work here signs. I know Carol's gotten some emails, and uh, we've gotten some statewide people driving through Pennsylvania. I think that's a very and, effective. And they thing. and they say that that really hits home. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of sharing of ideas. Uh, we have a term for it. We call it benchmarking, comparing with other states and and what they're doing. And uh, and Carol's part of a local committee. We also have a statewide committee now focused in on work zone safety and coming up on some of these ideas and looking what other states are doing. We even got a call from the ministry, Minister of Transportation of Canada on our My Mommy, My Daddy Works Against oh, really? Science. Yeah. yeah. That someone from that office was driving through um, northeastern Pennsylvania. They saw one of our size signs. When they got back up there, they called us and said, what are these about? We like them. When you realize, and you're talking about you know, Canada, different states contacting uh, PennDOT in, in uh, about their programs. When you consider 80 and 81 especially, not mm -hmm. even mentioning 84, 380, the turnpike, we have the world literally traveling through it every single day. When you get right. calls from people in Canada or other states, that's a testament that you know they've traveled through and they haven't seen it anyplace else. Let me ask Dave and Carol a question. I've noticed, and we've been around a long time covering different good, the bad, and the ugly stories in mm -hmm. the highways. I get a, a feeling, more so than anything in recent memory, that PennDOT workers, your crews out there, the people with the vest, both male and female, managers, the, the guys in the trenches, ladies in the trenches, they're really together now. I mean, this Bradley d tragedy has really brought them together more so than ever, ever before, at least in recent memory. And that's the feeling I get. And we've even gone so far where we've gone to places to do a story on paving a road on a, on a back street somewhere in Sugar Grove mm -hmm. Township. And you know what? They'll give us the thumbs up as yeah. we're going by because they know that we're out there also trying to spread the word to keep it safe. Before yeah. this, our, our men and our women, they all have, uh, you know, a litany of war stories they can tell about their near misses, what has happened to them. But when someone so close to you um, gets killed like that, right now emotions are really running high with our people. We, we've suffered a terrible, terrible loss. It's like losing a member of your family. Um, Dick Bradley was with us for over 15 years. So he was a member of the family, and you have to feel for the men that were standing there with him when this all happened. It, it's something that they'll not, they'll never forget. And you know, this the replays every time they hear, you know, even hear about work zone safety. This is always going to remind them of what happened, and it it has moved to make it more cohesive movement, and it has moved to bring it more forward into the public eye. So, again, uh, tragedies do that, but it, this is something these guys are, are, they have to live with. And it's really tough because every day they go out there, it reminds them of what happened. Is it different when they're working on night construction as opposed to day construction? Yeah, night construction is definitely more hazardous. And night construction is done as a service to our customers. We call everybody who drives in Pennsylvania, anybody who uses transportation, <laughs> our customer. And we talk a lot about customer service. And... Uh, People don't want to, don't like to be stuck in traffic jams, no matter what, and especially on Interstate 81, because as Andy was mentioning, all the traffic on 81 has, has more than doubled in the past 10 years. And uh, whenever we do anything major on Interstate 81, we try to do it at night, if at all possible. And the reason for that is there's less traffic, and there would be less backups. But w with night time work comes night more hazards. Um, there is an interesting sidelight to that, though. Some of the guys say they prefer working at night mm -hmm. because they can see the car headlights. Mm -hmm and they know when somebody, somebody's coming. So they have a little bit of a warning. So it, it's, a little, it's a little more dangerous because there's less sight for both sides, for the workers and for the, car, and for the drivers. But it's also a little safer because uh, there's less traffic and, uh, then, and then our guys could actually see something coming. 
We also see a lot more truck traffic on our on Pennsylvania highways oh, yeah. anymore. And is, does that contribute to the problem? Well, this the Northeast corridor here, where 81, is among the most heavily used truck corridors in in the eastern United States. And has it contributed more? Ironically, from what we're being told, um, for the most part, the truckers are pretty good about work zones. Um, you know, once in a while we'll hear, you know, a truck literally blew through, but um, there are some really rigid safety standards in the trucking industry, especially when it comes to work zones and highway construction. And for the most part, I have to say that, because um, I've contacted the safety managers for all the trucking companies around here, because every once in a while when we do go put up a work zone, I'll call them and say, look, you need to know that this is going to be there, and if you have people coming from out of state, please alert them. So they've been very cooperative, but you're right. The, the traffic has almost, um, from the figures I've looked at, almost quadrupled. But that's not just here. That's everywhere, um, especially the, the biggest boom right now is um, with like UPS, FedEx, because of the Internet and to get all these things delivered. So that, yeah, we are seeing a real increase in the trucks. I think the truckers, to a point, too, also uh, appreciate the work. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are, they're traveling on the roads every day. They know that we're not there just to tie up traffic, that we're out <laughs> there to fix the roads. And they know that uh, what we're doing is going to make it better for them in the future. And so they'll put up with the temporary inconvenience, as the saying goes. And, and uh, they, they can say, oh, well, I'll sit in this one or I'll, I'll go through this work zone kind of slow today because I know that these guys are out here trying to make Pennsylvania roads better. And even in Overdrive magazine, that once ranked us the worst roads in the country, now ranks us as the most improved. So uh, they see the difference. They see what, uh, what we're trying to do out there. But uh, that when we're fixing the roads, that does mean constructions and work areas. Well, we want to hear much more about what is under construction and what we can look forward to in the rest of the uh, PennDOT year uh, when we return with 28 Newsmakers right after this. Welcome back to 28 Newsmakers. I'm Jane Ann Bugda, joined by Andy Mahalshik, Carol Crane, and Dave Crisanda. Our topic this morning is PennDOT. And uh, we've been noticing on the highways that our exit signs are now renumbered. And I was just wondering, uh, what was the thinking behind that? And was there any backlash from any businesses who may have had brochures made up with the old exit signs? Well, let me, I'll answer the first question first when you say, where did it come from? And we mentioned earlier about customers. Our customers are everybody who drives in Pennsylvania and it came as a customer request. Um, what a lot of people may not realize is that most states, except for New England and New York, have mileage-based exit numbers. You go to Virginia, Ohio, out west, and you'll have mileage-based exit numbers. And what uh, mileage-based exit numbers are, for people who don't realize, it's there's little mile posts on the side of the road, and they start at the state border, usually on, on, a, on an interstate like on 81. In, in 81's case, it starts at Maryland. And every mile, there's a marker. Mile mark. You go one mile into Pennsylvania, one mile, two miles. It's a mile marker two, etc. So when you see Troop Dunmore as exit 188, that means it's 188 miles from the border of Maryland. So that's where that number came from. The other numbers were sequential. The first exit was one. The second number mm -hmm. was two, which didn't have much value for a traveler. And you and you might ask, well, well, what, what, how does this benefit the traveler? And I like to give this example of uh, someone uh, from Harrisburg who's coming up to a concert at Montage. 
and they uh, stop at Hazleton for gas. Well, the, with the old system, Hazleton exit was 43, and uh, Montage Mountain is 51. So you ask, how many miles is that? I have no idea, unless I pull out a map and look at the little miles markers on there. Now, under the new system, Hazleton is one, uh, 143, and uh, I'm sorry, what I forget what the Hazleton is now. Mm -hmm. I think it's 143. Mm -hmm. and You're close. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I drive every day. And, day, I don't know yeah. <laughs> and uh, Montage Mountain is 180, 182. So you just do the subtraction, and you know how many miles it is. So it makes it. So it's like 39 friendly. miles away. Now, what about anybody that has brochures made up? Have, has anybody complained? Well, we really started talking about doing this a long time ago. And when they uh, talked about doing it and made the decision to do a PennDOT, they met focus groups and, and people from the hotel and the travel industries who also supported it. Um, so for two years or, or even longer, we've been talking about this. So, and we've been letting them know what's, you know, every step of the way. And we've been sending out news releases and I don't know, how many did you send out? Oh, at least this? at least 10 releases on Yeah, this. at least 10. So, you know, we've been keeping them. And what, for the most part, it seems that what they've been doing is they're using up their old stock. And they're not throwing in, you know, things and I out. think I think the saving grace of the whole thing is that we have the old exit numbers on the bottom of yeah, the sign. For the next two years. And it's going to be at least two years. I mean, that's the minimum. So they could be up for three, four years for that matter until people finally get used to the new exit numbers. And with any change, it... Uh, it takes some adjustment, but I think once people get used to it, because if you know your hotels at exit 190, this is mostly for destination travels. Mm -hmm. You know your hotels at exit 190, and you pass mile marker 150, and you have you have 40 miles to go. And it's also if you know where you're going to stop for gas or whatever like that, you can tell just for the little math mathematics. You have to get your old uh, adding and subtracting mm -hmm. skills in the head back together, which is you know good. I'm sure all the mathematics teachers out there would like that. But uh, in the in the long run. If you get to use them, if you know what the value of them is, it's, it benefits it you. Help everyone. And, and I would think the local, obviously the local people, natives, already know where the exits are. Well, one of my and favorite stories on that is uh, I was, we were talking around at my uh, parents' house one day. My mother and Aunt Helen were there talking about it, you know, and, and they said, well, we'll get used to it. And then my, my Aunt Helen said, it doesn't matter to me. I never look at the numbers. I only look at the names. So for a lot of people, local people, that's what it is. They go by the names. They go by the Montage Mountain Road. They go by uh, Davis Street. They go by uh, Troop Dunmore. They go by you know, the Wilkes-Barre Bear Creek. So that's, that's what's important to them. Now, how does PennDOT decide which roadways and which highways get fixed? Well, we would need about a three-hour show for me to explain. Can we put in a request? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> there, one of the best ways, every, there's what's called, uh, it has a couple of different names, but a lot of people have heard of the 12-year plan or the Transportation Improvement Plan. And basically, it's PennDOT's things to-do list, the projects that are coming up and what's going to be done over the next 12 years or four years or whatever. It gets updated every two years. But you put all this on your website. Yeah, too. it's all on the website, too. And coming up in October in Scranton, the location hasn't been announced, but it will be uh, announced. There's going to be the next, what's called a State Transportation Commission hearing. And uh, people who want to testify at that can contact us and through the website. We have our email addresses on there. Or they could uh, give us a call in Dunmore or, or call our 100 Fix Road number for that matter mm -hmm. and uh, let us know. And we'll tell them how they could, could they fill out the proper forms to testify. And they get before this commission and somebody will say, hey, this road needs attention. Why don't you guys look at it? And what happens to make a long, 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 long story short is there's so much money available and there's so many projects that need to be done. And the State Transportation Commission, which is not just PennDOT, it's PennDOT, it's our local planning partners, uh, development agencies, county commissioners, transportation officials, people from the travel industry, trucking industry, busing industry. They all come together and basically decide, okay, we got all these requests for things that need to be done. We have so much money. Well, who's going to get what? And that's that list of projects I talked about, that 12-year plan, and that's how it gets developed. So it's not some guy sitting in a back room somewhere saying, oh, I, I, I like this map road on the map. I'm going to fix this one. It's a long, evolved process, process involving state, federal, and local, and just people out of the community. Dave, I have to ask this question. I'm sure a lot of people uh, see them along the highway. It looks like cameras, mm -hmm. solar panels. One's all, some of the devices are obviously weather-type related. Mm -hmm. Can you now, with those cameras, visually monitor that stretch of highway and what are they for mainly to check road conditions yeah they're for a couple different purposes uh, road conditions is a major part of it in the winter time especially but some of these uh, cameras have built-in sensors and what they do is uh, 
they can tell us that if traffic starts to slow down, and the alarm will go off, basically, and it'll tell us that uh, something is wrong on the interstate. And that way we can find out as soon as it's happening before we have to report for somebody to call in and we can investigate, is it a roadway problem, is it an emergency problem, and we could uh, get involved with state police. This is all what's called, uh, it's called we, everything's initials for us, so we call it ITS, which is Intelligent Transportation System. And we use, basically what that means is using technology to move traffic more efficiently on highways. And these cameras, um, we have uh, radio stations, little blower power radio stations along the road. We have our flashing electronic mm -hmm. signs that we can put messages on at any time from anywhere. And all that is to kind of inform the driver what's going on so they can make a better decision on where to go. I thought it was pretty neat that the um, winter road condition hotline now also is doubles as the uh, summer construction hotline. So uh, phone call, if you make a phone call, you tell what's under construction. Has this been helpful for people? Do you get a lot of use of the numbers or people on your website checking in? We get people call constantly asking us for road conditions and it's really get great to be able to refer them to that number. Um, now this is mainly interstate that, we're, that it deals with, but usually that's why they're calling us. They have a long trip, they're going on the interstate, so that's great and with the cameras ideally ultimately what's going to happen is they're going to be able to get on their computer, look to see the roadway at their destination, see if it's dry, wet, snow covered. They'll be able to see their trip every step of the way when, when all this is done. If I can make one plug for our website, you talked about road construction information. We have, uh, which is a recent, uh, we just started in January and we're just updating it now. If you go to that address there, www.dot.state.pa.us, that'll get you the Penn.home homepage. And if you click on regional information, and then click on the northeast part of the state, you'll get to our homepage. And uh, click on road work. And in everything in Lackawanna, Luzerne, uh, Pike, Susquehanna, Wayne, Wyoming, every project that's going on is on there. So uh, you can click there and you could find out if they're paving your road, basically. So there's a wealth of information on, on the website. Yeah, and that's something new. So that's something we didn't have available it's, it's for an, this year. I, I've been yeah. on it, and it, it does have a, yeah, a, lo a lot not, of information on there. It's not just um, highway construction. There's a lot of safety, highway safety information on there, how to get highway safety information, who to call for it. Now, when you call 1-800-FIX-ROAD, that's if you have a problem on the interstate and you think that it's maybe not as smooth as you should be riding mm -hmm. on or if there's some sort of problem with it. And, and how fast do they respond to something like that? Just We have about a minute left. How fa fast does PennDOT respond if they get a call? When we that? get a complaint, it immediately goes to the county maintenance office because they're the guys that, that do the work. Nine times out of ten, I mean, if it's if it's something major, they go right out. Yeah, if it's it. a hazard, if it's a if, hazard, yeah, if it's something, if there's major. something in the roadway or a, or a pothole that uh, could be uh, causing trouble with on the interstate that may knock out some tires or things like that, they respond immediately. But if it's a smaller problem, within two days. Well, there's no doubt about it. In a half hour, we can't talk about every aspect of PennDOT, but when you think of all the miles of road you take care of, and the millions of cars every month, I would venture to say. Uh, and when really, relatively speaking, the few number of accidents, even regular, you know, car crashes, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hard road to hoe. That's so. an amazing, uh, just one little quick statistic in that uh, as traffic has quadrupled, tripled, and God knows what, in the last uh, 50 years, fatal accidents have actually gone down. And we know PennDOT is there, and we thank you for joining us this morning. Take care.